Uh, our main text for this morning is going to be taken from the epistle that Paul that he wrote to Tim Titus. It's going to be Titus chapter 2, verse 11, and going through verse 14. Our main verse will be verse 10. But before we get into that actual passage, I want to first read from Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. In verse 7, Revelation 12, we read, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, the dragon with his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives to the dead. Now the, you know, the, the, the war with Russia and Ukraine is in its third year. Seems to continue on. No and in sight. So it is with the war in Israel, the Somas, that uh, through those wars, through other uh, places in which there are conflicts, there have been so many deaths, there's so much destruction. And it doesn't matter on whose side you're on, both sides have mothers and, and children weeping and the loss of loved ones. Those are examples of the world in which we live today. A world uh, that, again, is in, in sin, it's a fallen world, world of conflict. Uh, there are only, those are examples of this present day reality of a sinful world. And this stands in stark contrast to that war we just read about in Revelation chapter 12, where John sees this vision. It's a vision of a war in heaven. And with the use of symbolic imagery, typology, John describes one by the name of Michael. And he is one who leaves with his angel to fight against this horrible dragon and this dragon's angel. Now, Michael is one of the names that's described to our Lord, our Lord Jesus. Michael means one who is like God. And it's described as being the chief, the first, the last, the beginning, the ending, the preeminent one. And so this name was used several times also in the Old Testament, pertaining to the one who had authority over all kingdoms and all nations and all principalities and all powers. The highest position as prince over, over the hosts of heaven and also over men. The dragon has several titles given to him that reveals who it is, and reveals his wicked nature. That old serpent that points back to the garden and the fall into sin, and the serpent tempting Eve and leading her to question the word of God with the lie. The, the title devil means slanderer, slander of God, the slander of God's people. Satan means adversary. He is the enemy of God and God's people. And this is insight into the war between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. The, the true King Jesus and war against the liar and deceiver, Satan. And it is a fierce battle. And it's a battle that costs. And it, the cost was the blood of the Lamb of God. It was by the blood of the Lamb the old dragon was overcome. The dragon was cast out, cast to the earth where he continues his wickedness. He sows deceit, 
all sin and evil, causing chaos and division in the world. But he does so knowing that his time is short, and he knows that he is already a defeated enemy, defeated both because he knows that Jesus has won, that Jesus is the victor. 1 John 3 8 says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The wars that are waged between nations in this world, you know that often we get this sense of hopelessness. There's little hope. Even when one side wins, there, there's still lasting pain. There's still sorrow. No hope that it's not going to happen again. History is painted with, with the blood of defeat. And this is what makes the war between Michael and his angels against the dragon and his angels so different. Because there is victory. And it's a complete victory. And the victory that was gained by Christ is a true victory, a complete victory. It is a lasting victory. It's not simply a hope that there might be victory in this battle, but then it, it could turn against us sometime. This is a solid, unending victory. Or we might say faith that we have is in the victor, the complete and eternal victor. Do any of you who are a couple years older than I am remember this phrase, here I come to save the day? Anybody remember that? Know that? For those of the younger generation, it's the, the, the classic catchphrase of that cartoon superhero, uh, Mighty Mouse. And when those poor sheep were being tormented and threatened and eaten by the bad wolves, as they began to cry out in fear, they would uh, they would hear loud and powerful, Here I come to save the day. That was telling them that Mighty Mouse was on his way to, to right the wrong and save the day. Mighty Mouse, the symbol of hope, it was a symbol of courage, swooping in just at the right time to save, to solve the problems, and to defeat the wolves with his superpowers. I used to love that cartoon and shared on that little mouse who could just, you know, really come all beat up those bad wolves. But now that I'm no longer a child, I put away childish things. <laughs> there is one greater, there's one more true and one more real superhero than the cartoon mouse. And this we find given to us, revealed to us in Titus chapter 2 says in verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Jesus came, appeared at the time appointed, and he did so to defeat the one who held sinners captive. He came to deliver his sheep from that dragon. He destroyed the works of the devil in order for us to be saved from the mastery of sin and the consequences of sin. So much so, he by his grace saved us, he gave us life so that we might no longer live for the flesh and live as children of wrath and disobedient. But verse 12, we now deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. We live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That, brothers and sisters, would be impossible for us without the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Without Christ Jesus, we have nothing to walk in victory over the flesh, over sin. If Jesus is not won the victory on the cross and rose from the dead, what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15, 17? He said, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. That's because Jesus Christ appeared. He came, gave us life for us, that we then now deny these saints of ungodliness, worldly lusts. We've been delivered from mastery of sin 
and the masters. It's because of the victory in Jesus Christ. It's victory for the church is based on that divine historical fact. Jesus Christ came. He died. And he rose again. To live the life of a victor is not based on if you personally have the power and ability the, or your own inner gumption. An old word that my dad often uses. Gumption. If you have enough gumption, you could then live a certain life, follow certain laws and certain rules and regulations. Not your own personal gumption. It's founded in and through the one who defeated this, this old enemy, the devil, and will one day have that last, last enemy, uh, which is death, defeated. He did this when he rose from the dead in victory. And therefore, brothers and sisters, that the victory is not something we only hope for, but is for us a present reality. Tony writes at the end of verse 12, in the present age, at this time, do you and I truly grasp that truth? God's grace toward us and his victory for us is not just given as a means to only think uh, of our hope and victory when we die in the presence of the Lord. Sometimes it's easy uh, to get discouraged and and want life to, to just come to its conclusion, to its end, wanting the Lord to get us out of this mess. And there is a lot of mess. And we, we wish to escape that mess. We wish to escape the hard part of living. But is that what Paul instructs uh, Titus to think like? He's saying to Titus, no, we know the Roman emperor, while well, he's totally insane, Cities are filled with temples to idols. The rich have their gluttons, this immoral feast and drunkenness, and the poor live while they're in just abject poverty. Slaves are treated like animals, and Christians are being put to death. Now, of course, we cry, Lord Jesus, come quickly, but we are not like those without hope, even in those circumstances. Therefore, even a world that hates Christ. And its rulers are corrupt. We don't just sit down in despair and say, well, let's wish it was over. I have nothing left to live for. Church is defeated. I'm defeated. Well, dear brothers and sisters, what does Paul begin with in verse 13? Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now this looking here, this is not a sign of defeated them. Now that aspect of I just wish he would get us out of this mess. Well, there's, there's nothing I can do, so I'll simply look and hope that Jesus will come and get us out of here. All these struggles and trials. No, this is better than this. Brothers and sisters, this is actually a call uh, with hopeful expectation of victory while we are living godly lives in this ungodly world because it is uh, resting in the victory of Christ that he did rise from the dead, is presently on the throne, and will at the right time determined by God, he will come again, and he will deliver us. So it's not a despairing promise. It is a victory cry. There are today, as there have been from the beginning, people, religions, philosophies, who offer to the world a false hope. They offer what they call hope for their personal lives or, or hope for the nation. Uh, they claim to offer physical victory or material victory. You can have it all. Some even do so in the name of Christianity. You can have your cake and eat it too in quite abundance. Promise after promise. Life will be so much better when they're put into places of power, when, when you have authority. 
that when they get authority, are these promises fulfilled? Promises are for me. Promises are for God. Promises are ignored. I have to think of that. I talked about that with Christmas the other day. How that so often when we get into election time, election period, people look at the leader and they think, this is the one that's going to save our country. All the promises. find often, most often, not all the time, they're not the hope that people look for. As Christian people, as followers of Christ, we have been given great promises, greater promises than any, any ruler or any person in this world can give. He's given us great and precious promises, and, and though we look forward to the, the final completion of all things, bringing us into the perfect hope, we even today live with that perfect, perfect, glorious, present victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. We live today not in defeat, but in victory in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, it says, But we have this treasure in earth and vessel, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. So, Looking back in verse 13, that word looking. And it's not looking with a despair in our hearts, wishing, oh, I wish it was over. I just can't take it any longer. This looking is worth it means expecting. And while you're expecting, you're expending your time, and you're spending your time living. What it means is more than just looking ahead in the future for the victory that we have in Christ, but we now live looking and living in that victory. Dear one, do you believe that today, that if you're in Christ, there are more than conquerors? There are more than conquerors who Christ who died for us and rose for us. If you're looking unto Jesus, He's putting aside the way to sin that so easily he sends us. You look unto him, you run the race set before you. You do not do so with despair, you do so with a, a reliance and a faith upon Christ, anticipating that he is coming in glory and will present you glories for him. Christ dies for us. He rose for us so that even with all the troubles in the church and in the world today, we are members of a victorious body, a victorious church, because Jesus died for her, rose for her, and is building her, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. And that's a fact. And that's what we look ahead for because we know that we are already part of a victorious church in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. You ever seek to be a witness for the Lord and you you share the gospel with somebody in the family, a friend, or a stranger, somebody you work with, and then afterwards you feel like, oh, you, that was a, that, that really, when you stumble on that, you really feel discouraged because of it. Or feel discouraged because they responded in anger against, they didn't want to listen at all. Brothers and sisters, don't be in despair. 
Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us spreads the fragrance of his knowledge in every place, whether it be to those who don't believe or to those who do believe. It. Live in the victory of Christ. Live in the victory of Christ. Do not be used to it. Present victory is not on shaky ground. It's a present victory that will empower the church not to simply wait, but to live and wait for the blessed hope, as in verse 13 says, looking for the blessed hope. So again, looking doesn't just mean looking. It doesn't mean just sitting down and looking in the distance and just waiting for it to happen. It means to anticipate and set one's mind upon and your heart upon it. And the word blessed adds that emotional quality, that of joy. It's a joyful hope. It's a, it, it also has value. But blessed has both those, those meanings to it, joy and value. So the hope that we have in Christ is a joyful, happy, blessed hope, which is of extreme value because it's an eternal value. It's difficult to pinpoint all the reasons a Christian may come to a place of feeling defeated. There may be physical reasons, uh, mental reasons, emotional reasons. It may be due to the enemy buffeting. It may be a time of testing. You know, you're following the path of Jesus who is, who is led by the spirit of the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. It's hard. And it, it can give that sense of despair. A, a, a time of darkness within the heart and mind. And though you may be there right now, if there are any that wilderness testing in the valley of the shadow of death, even this morning, there, there, there may be some of you here that might have that. We have here a call not from the world from heaven, but the one who won the victory over sin and death for you and for me. He said, Look at your blessed hope. Look up. Look up for your blessed hope. You know, I know personally how difficult it is to, to look up when the weight feels so heavy. Or, or to look up and, and, and see the light when it seems so dark. So dark. But this makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. Even in a world under the curse of sin, look and see your blessed hope. Rest in your blessed hope. Again, what is the blessed hope that we have this morning, brothers and sisters? This hope is so sure, and this hope has been given to us within your hearts by faith. The world sees it shine in you when you when you are presented by Christ to the world as a as one of his embers of light, the gospel. What is that blessed hope? Well, if you wonder where this blessed hope comes from and what it is. It begins by the word of God being given to you and to me, the promises of God's word. Romans 15, verse 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we who faith in the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Comfort of the scriptures might have hope. <clears throat> have you found the scriptures? Be a source of hope when all other sources fail. We have a more sure word of prophecy. We have the word of God to man. We have the living word, which is Christ himself. When, when doubts arise, when, you, when you're fearing things, when fear lies at your heart's door, when, when there are these questions that trouble you, trouble your mind. Go to the source. Go, go to the word. Hide that word in your heart. 
Read it, study it, meditate upon it. Feed your soul with the eternal living word of God. It, it's the inspired word. It's, it's the unchanging word. It's the word of comfort. From this never-ending source of hope, we're given the reason that it is a blessed hope. It's for the child of God, given many, many promises. We are promised blessed hope that anchors our soul, even in storms of life. Hebrews 6, 18 says, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Blessed hope. It's an anchor. It holds us fast in the midst of the storm. It's sure, steadfast, will not break, it will not let go. It is sure. Our hope is a blessed hope because even death can't take that hope away. Proverbs 14, 32 says, The wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous has hope in his death. The hope you have today in Christ will not someday disappear. And even death will not take away what that hope promises. This is the blessed hope because he assures us of immortality. Acts 24, 14 says, But this I confess unto you, that after the way which they call heresy, I worship. And I worship the God of my Father, believing all things which are written in the law of the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. So the blessed hope assures us of the resurrection of the last day. Our hope is blessed because of the promise that we have also an eternal treasure in heaven. Colossians 1 verse 3 says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Wherefore you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel. There it gives that double. It's a, a, again, the word of God gives that comfort and the assurance of, of the blessed hope we have. And it is also a blessed hope that is in the most secure place ever. More secure than any bank in this world. More secure than any mattress that one might find their money in. It is a Hope that's laid up for us in heaven. That place in heaven. Satan's not. We just read in Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, he's been cast down, and that war in heaven. There's no place there. And so if our hope is secure. It's anchored in Christ Jesus on the throne. Truth that makes all of our hopes so blessed is Jesus Christ Himself. He is our blessed hope. He died on the cross, He was buried, and rose again from the dead, giving us the hope that we too will be raised from the dead and never, never to die again. First Peter 1 says this in that uh, wonderful epistle. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we have this present victory because of that historical divine fact Jesus came into this world he died on the cross for our sins he was buried and he rose in victory crushing the enemy bringing a present victory with a blessed hope, and it all points to future deliverance. And looking at verse 13, it says, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, 
Jesus Christ. Our present victory and our blessed hope promises without question future deliverance. Future deliverance. Hebrews 9.27, it says, As it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 9, it says, Yes, we have the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death. Did that pass when he delivered us, when he went to the cross? He does deliver us. There's that present hope. And who we trust that he will still deliver us. He will continue and he will deliver us right to the end. 1 Thessalonians 1 9 it says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for a son from heaven to be raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. What a wonderful, amazing statement! Delivers us from the wrath to come. The language Paul uses here in Titus 2 and these other passages highlights the manifestation of Jesus Christ in all of his glory, his sovereignty, his majestic power, conquering, being victory, victorious over sin and over death, over the devil, that he delivered us, he is delivering us, and he will deliver us. Deliver us from such a great, horrible death, an eternal wrath to come. What a glorious Savior. What a glorious, wonderful, hopeful, uh, blessed hope we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, in all his glory, majestic power, is coming with full purpose in delivering people. Throughout the scriptures, the, the, the description that is given. Of the Lord's coming again is described in such a manner to both warn some as well as to comfort others. First of all, it's to warn the unbeliever, to warn the wicked that there is a wrath to come. It's to, to warn the flock, those who are, are lazy, slothful, and disobedient, and to call them to. Be reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. They too might flee the wrath of God. In Jude, verse 14, it says, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convict all who are ungodly. When Jesus came to die for sin, he said, I have not come to condemn the world that the world through me might be saved. He came to seek and to save the lost. When he comes again, he is coming as a judge. And this should give us a greater compassion and, and a greater zeal to pray for the lost and to spread the gospel because when he comes, those who are believing and disobedient to the gospel 2 Thessalonians it tells us in the first chapter there that he'll come in his great glory and fire and he'll devour them. This should give us not a, a sense of how oh, they get what they deserve, but it should give us a sense of glory. Have mercy upon them. Have mercy upon them. May they be brought to know that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of hope. Today is the day of the gospel victory. 
And as we live godly lives by the power of the risen Christ, and we are living in this present sinful world, we live in the present victory. We rejoice with the blessed hope because we with joy wait for that day, hearing of our great God and Savior, as for us, brothers and sisters. For us, this is a message of comfort. And for those who are believers, if there are any of you here this morning, say, flee the wrath of God. Flee to Christ. Because there is no comfort until you are in Christ. For us, these truths do give us comfort. We're not looking for the coming of just anyone, not looking just for the coming of another man or angel. We are looking. We are waiting with hope and in victory for the coming of the one who was, and is, and is to come, the Almighty, the very God, the very man, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who gave his life on the cross and suffered, who bore that wrath. Very one who died and rose again and ascended. He will come just as he promised, and he will deliver us from this corruption, and we will be with him, and we will be like him. He's our present victory by having saved us from sin and death. He delivered us from the bondage of the enemy, conquered and crushed the enemy's head, and he saves us and keeps us. No one can pluck us from his hands. Sovereign hands, he's our blessed hope that he will at last save us, he'll deliver us, bring us to glory. That's comfort. My dear people, if, if I was to give only one message in my life, it would be this one because it's the message of victory in a world that is so defeated by sin and crushed by sin. The message of hope for those who are. In this world is still living in hopelessness. It's a message of deliverance. It's a message of eternal salvation when Jesus comes. People often say, well, what's the hope for Canada? Christ is the hope. Christ is the hope. Was this your hope here this morning? Are you looking to Christ? Are you living in Christ? Looking with joy and anticipation for the coming of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. I hope you all are this morning. And if not, I pray that the Lord will make you ready this very hour. Look to Christ. Look and live. Live in His present victory. Looking to living in His blessed hope and looking for that future deliverance. And He comes. And all His glory lives. Brothers and sisters, this is what brings us into this. The Lord's day. We remember what Jesus did 2,000 years ago on the cross and know that it is still a present fulfillment in reality in our lives. That's not just a historical event, but it is a present deliverance that has been given to us for the future of hope when Christ shall come. I'm going to call upon our servers, elders and deacons, to come forward at this time. As we take it, we remember the victory that is ours in Jesus Christ as we take of the bread, take of the cup, remember, of his body broken for us, blood 